possibly saw the sun. But I know there's so many good sessions, it's really hard to figure out what to do. We're going to change the order a little bit um, and just flip the, the first two sessions. I am so excited. This panel, we got these guys together. Um, <laughs> it's been a, a dream of mine to have this group together, and it, um, throughout the year we've had some lively discussion. Um, but here they are on stage for epidemiology around the world. Sounds like a Disneyland ride, but actually um, it's incredibly important that we all understand what's going on with epidemiology and we're able to hear from it from many perspectives. So we have a panel of speakers. We have Dr. Marsha Lynn Jurgen also, and if you were here yesterday, you don't need to know more about her. <laughs> she says no. Um, but if you weren't here yesterday, um, just a, she's a developmental pediatrician and medical epidemiologist in the Division of Congenital and Developmental Disorders at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. We also have Haley smithers Sheedy, um, who is a um, PhD and a research fellow at the Cerebral Palsy Alliance and the Marie Bashir Institute, um, both at the University of Sydney and a postdoctoral research fellow with Australasian Cerebral Palsy Clinical Trials Network. In addition, uh, as we travel to Europe, we have Catherine Arno, who graduated from University of Montpellier in 1992 with a doctorate in medicine and a graduate degree in public health. Um, she is currently an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health for Paul Sabatier University, Toulouse, as well as deputy director in the Joint Research Unit, UMR, in uh, Toulouse University. And then finally, right here, right in Montreal, we have Mariam Oskui, a pediatric neurologist and epidemiologist. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill University, associate director in the Division of Pediatric Neurology at the Montreal Children's Hospital, and the co-director of the Canadian Cerebral Palsy Registry. Take it away, guys. Okay. So are you going to put the slides I don't um, down here so that we can see them? Okay. Um, can I ask our audiovisual team to put up the slides for the epidemiology panel since we've made yeah. that change? Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Good. That's good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, leave it to Sarah to give me a challenge. So first of all, I'm challenged with the task of providing an overview in order to put our presentations in context. As we started meeting and talking about this panel, we realized that we were using different terminology to refer to the same things. So this is mostly for us, the four of us, so that we can get it straight in terms of what we're talking about, and it may help you as well. So starting with terminology, and some of you have heard these terms and you may also wonder what we mean when we use these terms. So in the US, we refer to population-based surveillance and I have the examples from our CDC work, um, the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring work, work, Network and the Metropolitan Atlanta Developmental Disability Surveillance Program. I'm gonna talk more about uh, our US-based surveillance. We also hear the term register or registry, either one, outside the U.S., and we have three lovely examples of that, and my colleagues are going to present information from the Australian CP register, surveillance of CP in Europe, and the Canadian CP registry. But what I want everyone to keep in mind is when we use those different terms, the methods are similar, the purposes are the same. We want to contrast that with clinical registries, and we use this term in the U.S., and I have an example based on the Cerebral Palsy Research Network, the CPRN, and the methods for the CPRN and clinical registries are different, and the purposes are different. 
I'd like to introduce the public health concept of surveillance, and this might be a new term for some of you. Um, but sometimes we hear the term surveillance and it's kind of frightening. We think of big brothers watching you, and it has a negative connotation. But there is a very positive definition of public health surveillance, and I have a reference there. It's the systematic ongoing assessment of the health of a community based on the collection, interpretation, and use of health data and information. Surveillance provides information necessary for public health decision making. There are a number of different methods for conducting public health surveillance, but the one that we're going to focus on is the last, ongoing population-based record review. Active surveillance, and we use other terms because of the negative connotation sometimes with surveillance, we also call it monitoring or tracking of a condition or conditions where information is systematically collected via standardized data collection instruments by review of existing records at data sources. Outside the U.S., the term register is often used for a very similar activity. This is my example from the ongoing population-based record review methods used at CDC. And I'm going to go through quickly the strengths and then talk about some of the limitations. So the strengths are there's no need to contact participants. As I said, it's record review. In the aggregate, it is representative of the particular geographic area. There are objective, reliable measures that are used for our case definition. It's individual level data with the ability to link to other data. There are multiple sources where we obtain the information. We may be able to generalize our findings to the overall population, and this depends very much on the size of the population. And it can be an ongoing program, as it has been in, in Atlanta at CDC. More strengths are as active, and active surveillance versus passive is. Passive is when the information is collected at the sources, and then it is sent to the health department or CDC. And you're probably not familiar with that. But we actually go out to the sources and collect the information. We call that active surveillance. Uh, there's extensive quality control measures built into the process. The um, process does not depend solely on a previous documentation of CP diagnoses, so I'll talk about that a little bit more, but we either look for a diagnosis or we look for a description of physical findings. So it's not dependent on just a, a provider making a diagnosis of CP. We can examine CP by subtypes and by race, ethnicity, and other characteristics. There's minimal burden because, again, it is based on record review, not on examination of patients, and it can be used to identify subjects for research studies. So what about the limitations? I mean, no system is perfect, so there are some limitations. So first, it's more labor intensive and costly to operate than the passive systems where the data are collected at the sources. The timeliness, we have to wait until the sources record the information before we can go and collect the information. The estimates may underestimate children with mild CP who don't come the to the attention of the providers, although by going to multiple sources, we hope that we are capturing most of the most affected children in the population and certainly those with activity limitations. There's a lack of completeness uh, in some of the records. We do see records where there's not enough information for us to include these children. And it's dependent on the availability of the records. I mean, some records just are not available for us. But in spite of all of that, we do feel like uh, that this is the gold standard approach um, to providing information for the prevalence of the uh, children with cerebral palsy. And it is also um, gives us the ability to look at prevalence estimates over time. Now, let's contrast that to clinical registries. A clinical registry is a database or list of patients and patient characteristics. Clinical registries can have multiple purposes, such as contact information on patients for research, longitudinal information about patient characteristics and interventions. Data on biobanking of blood, tissue, genetic, or other omics uh, are available, long, may be available. Long-term outcomes and quality improvement can be studied in this way. Clinical registries data may come from multiple sources, electronic medical records, interviews, and also reported by patients. 
The purposes of a clinical registry are to contact patients uh, for enrollment in studies, to characterize populations for a given condition, to generate hypotheses for additional studies, to observe practice variation across clinical centers and regions, to determine study feasibility, and to study the natural history of populations with a particular condition. My example is the Cerebral Palsy Research Network, uh, CPRN. We've had a number of uh, workshops and discussions about the CPRN. Um, I'd like to thank Paul Gross for these slides. And if you have any questions, please see Paul. So the CPRN collects patient characteristics, interventions, and outcomes. Uh, the information is entered into electronic medical records by a physician or a PT during a visit. The information is transferred by sites, and I was told initially 16 to Utah, into a centralized database. Uh, the CPRN supports hypotheses generation and study planning. It captures practice variation for quality improvement. And this is a really important point, is there's limited use of PHI, which is protected health information. So there are no names, social security numbers, no contact information is collected. And in this uh, day of concerns about privacy, I think that's very important to, to many patients. Only birth, month, and year and encounter dates are included as the PHI for the uh, CP Research Network. Uh, there's also a patient-powered community registry, which collects patient characteristics, interventions, and outcomes as well. The data are entered via surveys by people in the CP community. Uh, it enables study of long-term outcomes, supports survey-based uh, studies, and contact for additional research. And importantly, it can be linked to the CP or in clinical registry to enable additional studies and follow-up. So what are some of the advantages versus disadvantages of the clinical registry? Advantages are the data are collected as part of routine care by clinicians, so there's no need to have additional data collection. Uh, it's standardized uh, through the EMR. Uh, there's no duplicate data entry, as I mentioned. It includes patient characteristics, interventions, and outcomes. It's inexpensive because of the fact that it's already collected as part of a patient encounter. It's a rich uh, data set for studies and quality improvement, and it has the potential to follow patients uh, for, uh, throughout the lifespan. Okay, I'm sorry, I am way ahead. <laughs> okay, what are the disadvantages? So there are some obvious disadvantages as well. So it's not a fixed consistent data set from each site, so it re reflects the variation in practice. Uh, there can be, and usually um, is, some selection bias of patients uh, treated at particular um, urban, particularly urban settings. It requires an investment to get data collection running. It requires a change in clinical practice, so you have to get all of those doctors who are used to dictation to use electronic medical records instead, since that's the vehicle for data collection. It requires institutional buy-in, so you have to talk to the chief medical information officer and the IT folks about this. And it's privately funded uh, by donors and hospitals, and so that is also, uh, can be another disadvantage. So in summary, what I'd say to those of you who are interested in research is, regardless of what it's called, you have to think through whether surveillance, population-based surveillance, or register or registry, the method that's very similar, is this going to suit your needs, or do you need to use a clinical registry? And I will say, having gone through the advantages and disadvantages of each, that it really depends on the purpose for which you want to collect your data. So that is the overview that we are providing, and hopefully that will help you with some of the terminology as we go through our presentations. So I need the next presentation up, please. All right. And I assume that there will be questions at the end of all of our presentations. 
Okay, so I'm going to um, talk about what can population-based public health surveillance tell us about disparities in cerebral palsy. And I have nothing to disclose. Okay, I'm going to talk about the overview of our CDC um, CP surveillance efforts, talk about the current surveillance data on prevalence and demographic characteristics from the ADAM network, talk about ADAM data on racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities, and then provide a conclusion. So this is a map of the ADAM network, and you see it stands for Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. This is a map of 11 sites. All the states that are colored in are a part of the network by a cooperative agreement. All of the states are required to collect data on the prevalence and characteristics of the children that have ASD at eight years of age, and we report this every two years. Now, the sites have an opportunity to um, participate in other activities, and one of those activities is looking at children who are four years old using very similar methodology to the data collection for eight-year-olds. The other opportunity for the sites is to choose another disability. So in addition to ASD, they can also collect information and determine the prevalence of other disabilities. And during uh, these surveillance years, we had two sites, I mean, we had four sites that collected information on cerebral palsy in addition to ASD. And those four sites were Alabama, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Georgia. So how do we collect this data? Um, it is multiple source, and multiple source means that we go into the community and look at records from two sources, education sources and clinical sources. It is records um, review. It is, as I said before, we do not examine the children. We train abstractors to review and abstract selected records at these multiple sources that, for the most part, provide services to children with developmental disabilities. And what our abstractors are looking at in these records is they're either looking for a diagnosis of cerebral palsy or they're looking for physical findings that we have determined uh, indicate a high level of um, certainty that these children might have cerebral palsy. So after this information is collected from these records, we have trained clinicians who review the abstracted information from all the data sources for each child. And the trained clinicians are the ones that make the determination as to whether the child has CP or not. And it's based on a case definition, a strict case definition for cerebral palsy, given that the child has the findings that we have identified and the child is two years of age or older. So I'm going to talk about our findings related to prevalence. So from the beginning, from our first year of inception, from 2002, looking to our most recently published data in 2010, we see each surveillance year, the children are eight years old, so these represent the birth years, and then we either have three or four sites, and that's dependent upon funding availability, and we see that from 2002 to 2010, that our prevalence went from 3.6 per thousand, which is roughly one in 278 children, to 2.9 per thousand, which is one in 345 children. So we have seen a gradual decline in the prevalence of CP over this time period. Now, our CP surveillance areas in the U.S. reflect diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, which has allowed us to examine not only socioeconomic differences within the population of children with CP, but also racial ethnic differences in CP prevalence. Now, this slide shows the prevalence by race and ethnicity from the network, uh, again, for this time period. And what is um, really striking about these data is if you look at the prevalence in black children compared to white children, we see that there is a consistently higher prevalence in black children as compared to white children. Uh, this prevalence is consistently lower in Hispanic children, so you may ask about that, and we need to do more further investigation of that. We don't know why that's true. But even going back to our studies in the 80s, we have always reported a higher prevalence in black children compared to white children. 
As I mentioned, we found that black children appear to have this higher prevalence overall. So we used our ADAM data to examine whether the excess prevalence of CP among black children was present across all levels of functional limitations. So what you see on the slide is we have GMFCS levels one and two combined. These are obviously children who ambulate. We have GSMC, GMFCS level three, which is children who walk with assistance, and then levels um, four and five are combined, and these are children who have limited or no walking ability. 1.0 is the baseline, so anything above one means that the, the prevalence is higher in black children compared to white children. So our findings here indicated that black children had higher estimates of limited or no walking ability compared with white children. And in case you ask or you're thinking, you should be thinking, is this due to um, preterm birth? Is it due to low birth weight in black children compared to white children? We did those analyses and that did not explain the disparities there. Given the high correlation between black race and low SES in the US, these findings are consistent with those from the Canadian CP registry, which found socioeconomic elevation and lack of maternal education to be associated with elevated GMFCS levels of children with CP in Quebec. So it's always nice if your findings are consistent with those of your colleagues. So what are some theories? What do we think is going on here? And of course, we don't have any answers, but is it possible that there are racial differences in risk factors? Again, we looked at a couple, but maybe there's some others that we haven't looked at. Is this due to access to interventions? We know we have great interventions, and maybe certain kids are getting these interventions before others, but are interventions really that good? I don't know. Uh, then there's the question of whether we are under-identifying mild CP in black children. So is there some type of systematic under-identification in black children? We really don't know. Moving on, um, also using our ADAM data, we recently evaluated available indicators of socioeconomic status, including maternal educational attainment when a child is born, and the association with the risk of spastic CP. And we, in our paper, which is noted here, you can see that we looked at the, the same information in spastic versus non-spastic CP. And sometimes there were really no differences uh, related to non-spastic CP. So we chose to talk about the findings in spastic CP. We also looked at whether racial and ethnic disparities in CP persist after controlling for SES. So our first uh, hypothesis uh, was consistent with recent studies, we will find the risk of CP to decline with increasing socioeconomic status uh, using maternal education. Our second hypothesis is the observed racial and ethnic disparity in CP risk is due to confounding or is mediated by racial disparities in SES, and what we would find is there would no longer uh, be this disparity and difference after controlling for SES. And our third hypothesis was perinatal factors such as preterm birth and small for gestational age mediate the association between race as well as maternal education and CP risk so that after controlling for these perinatal factors, CP risk would not differ by race or maternal education. So let's look at the table that's provided with the data. And we're looking now at risk ratios and 95% confidence uh, intervals. And this is for spastic CP. So the first line, we are looking at the unadjusted rates, and we have black children, Hispanic children, and white children. We really only focus on the black children and the white children. White children are the reference. We look at the unadjusted um, risk ratio in black children. It's elevated. It's above one. So you don't have to be a, an epidemiologist to know that if it's over one, that's significant. And you can look at the confidence intervals in terms of statistical significance. But it's 1.5. So we found that the risk of spastic CP was more than 50% higher in black versus white children. So we adjusted. We adjusted for our measure of SES was maternal education. So when we did that, it's still high, right? It's 1.35. And so this did not uh, really um, account for this. Uh, some disparities in maternal education did not fully explain the excess CP risk among 
non-white children since when we adjusted the risk ratio was greater than one. So we adjusted again, and we adjusted this time, including perinatal risk factors. And after further adjustment for these factors, basically gestational age and birth weight, um, there was no longer a significant effect of race on the risk of spastic CP, kind of paradoxical, it's less than one. And this finding is consistent with those of some other colleagues in California. So how can we summarize this? We had these three hypotheses and we want to just summarize them. So in support of our first hypothesis, we found CP risk to decline with increasing SES. We give that a green light. Yes, that was true. Uh, secondly, contrary to our second hypothesis, we did not find the effects of SES on CP risk to fully explain the excess prevalence of CP in black children. So even after we control, remember we still had the 1.35. So that did not explain this um, effect, this um, difference in terms of uh, disparities in SES. So that's a red light. Now the third one is a little more complicated. Our third hypothesis was only partially supported by the findings. We did find that after controlling for perinatal risk factors, the excess risk of CP in black children was no longer present and the risk of CP was lower for black children. With respect to maternal education, however, our findings did not support that its protective effect on CP risk operated entirely um, through adjustment for perinatal uh, risk factors. So this um, adjustment for perinatal risk factors was reduced, but did not completely eliminate the association between maternal education and CP risk. So we gave that a yellow light because there were two different parts of this hypothesis and basically part of it was supported and part of it was not. So we need to think more, we need to do further research and we need to think about causal mechanisms, we need to think about the effects of other components of SES, we only use maternal education and then we also looked at a census um, based um, um, measure, but what about occupation, income and other factors? Uh, what about longitudinal trajectories? And from a public health standpoint, our goal is to reduce the risk of CP in the population overall to the level of risk experienced by offspring of college-educated women. So that's our goal. That's where we would like for, um, for all children uh, to be in terms of risk of CP. In summary overall, racial ethnic disparities exist among children with CP. Black children with CP are more likely to have limited or no walking ability. Black children are more likely to have spastic CP, even after controlling for socioeconomic status. However, the association between black race and excess CP risk seems to be accounted for by preterm birth and associated perinatal factors. Maternal education seems to be prote a protective factor overall, if you just look at the whole population uh, in terms of CP risk. And further research is needed to both better understand the disparities and inform prevention strategies. I'd like to just acknowledge our whole um, community uh, that works, that whole Adam net Network and people who work uh, on these data and our CP surveillance system, as well as dedicated um, colleagues at CDC who have um, helped provide the data and provide the slides. So there's my contact information. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So, presentation. So we are going to move to Europe with a completely different accent. Uh, I would like to present uh, our surveillance system in Europe and I will present some new results about the evolution of prevalence and some results about MRI results. I have nothing to disclose. Um, so SCP was, at, so surveillance of survival policy in Europe was established in 1998 as a collaboration of professional and researchers working in population-based registries of children with CP across Europe. 
It brings together data, population data, as Marjolein said, on CP, to first produce statistics on the occurrence of CP in well-defined populations to monitor trends over time. Second, to provide a framework for assessing the impact of CP in the community. And third, to assist in the establishment of public health and research priorities in the domain. So here is a map of Europe presenting the SCP registries with a large coverage of northern and western countries and uh, to a lesser extent uh, a coverage more disseminated um, registries in the eastern part. Well, when we uh, first worked together, the first task of the SCP was really to reach a consensus on case definition, on the clinical findings associated with each subgroup of cerebral palsy, allowing a classification of CP subtypes. So these common definitions and classifications were the result of a long and thorough harmonization process taking into consideration language particularities across the different member states and differences in societal, societal functioning across Europe. So the re reliability, the validity, and the simplicity of the ECP definitions and classification allow polling data over long periods of time and permit the interpretation of variation. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we also developed a video-based tool entitled the Reference and Training Manual of the ACPE, which provides a systematic approach to the clinical description of children with CP. It is useful for training purposes, as well as for disseminating good practices. It now includes the classification of MRI results that I will present in a few minutes. So our common database, which compiles data collected by 29 registries from birth cohort 1975, is really a powerful instrument to analyze trends over time in prevalence rates, but also to consider specific groups of children. So in our system, data from individual registries are submitted yearly on a web platform, and several uh, processes were established to improve data quality prior, during, and after the submission process. So the central database is currently hosted by the European Commission in ISPRA, in Italy, and uh, in Italy, there is a dedicated staff in charge of running the central database, which contain information on pregnancy, birth, neonatal period, of course, the description of CP condition, and neuroimaging results. So what are our findings? Here is the prevalence rate of pre, of pre and neonatally acquired CP in Europe over the last decade. We demonstrated a marked decline in the overall prevalence rate from 2.1 per thousand children in children born 1998 to 1.9 in children born in 2006. If we now look at the blue curve showing the severe cases, uh, severity being defined as GMFCS level 4 or 5, or an IQ below 50, we reported a slightly delayed but similar decrease in the prevalence rate that has for sure to be confirmed in the coming birth cohorts. 
Here is the distribution of motor function according to three year periods. So GMFCS level one and two in dark gray, uh, three in a light gray and four and five in blue. Uh, so we observed a significant decrease in the proportion of severe cases in the last period, so 2004 to 2006, compared to the previous ones, which confirms the recent downward trends in the prevalence of severe cases of CP. Over the same period of time, we didn't observe any significant change in the proportion of preterms, who represent in our network around 40% of the cases. And uh, it is not shown here, but a similar pattern with a declining prevalence is observed in both group of children born preterm and children born at term. Here is reported the evolution of CP subtypes presented as spastic forms, so unilateral and bilateral, test kinetic forms and all the other types grouped together, separately for children born preterm on the left part and children born at term on the right. So whereas no significant change was observed in the di distribution of clinical profiles in the group of preterm, the bilateral spastics form being the most prevalent in this group, we observed a significant increase in the proportion of the disconnected forms during the more recent period compared to previous ones in the group of children born at term. Indeed, if we precisely look at the evolution of the dyskinetic forms in terms of prevalence rate, we see that uh, we have an increase, then a decrease in the prevalence rate of this form. Uh, it is not clear whether this evolution is due to changes in the care of children born at term or not. However, uh, uh, these are very new and promising results. Well, the continuing improvement in the methods of recording data in registries has led to the development of a classification of brain imaging results. A new chapter was added in, to the reference and training manual, and it includes now MRI findings in the child with CP after the age of two years, along with a proposed standardized description of the images, which results in a classification for the predominant pattern with three main subgroups, the maldevelopments, the predominant white matter injuries, and the predominant gray matter injuries. If we now look at the results regarding these MRI findings, we first report that MRI was abnormal in more than 80% of the cases. The patterns of MRI results, of course, is clearly very different when we consider children born preterm and children born at term. Um, white matter injuries are observed in two thirds of the children born preterm and are even more prevalent in children born very early. Uh, in children born at term, we observe nearly the same proportion of white matter injuries and gray matter injuries. The MRI results are for some aspects in relation to functions, as shown in this slide. Again, when considering the predominant pattern, we can see that brain lesions are mainly white or gray matter injuries in more than 30% of the spastic forms, whereas gray matter injuries are predominant in this kinetic forms. To conclude, um, the analysis of children born between 1998 and 2006 in Europe showed a significant reduction in the overall prevalence and severity of cerebral palsy. 
At the very de recent decrease in the prevalence rate of dyskinetics forms has to be confirmed, and we now have a classification system to reliably report on the neuroimaging findings at the population level in the registries. I would like to thank my colleagues to pre pre we, who prepared the presentation with me and the families, of course, and if you want to have more information about our network, we have, you have here the, the names. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, and we've got another accent, this time from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, <laughs> I wish it was as beautiful an accent as Catherine's, but unfortunately not. Um, just waiting for my slides, there we go. Okay, so my name's Hayley and I'm a research fellow with the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance. And today I'll be talking to you about, of course, the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register, new registers in our region, and some, uh, an example of recruitment through the New South Wales and ACT CP register um, that was focused on a study around congenital cytomegalovirus and cerebral palsy. Sorry, just getting my head around this. It's the green. Press the green. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, as the previous speakers have noted, CP registers are not a new concept. In, an, in Australia, the state registers followed quickly behind our European counterparts, with the first CP registers commencing in Western Australia in 1979, followed by Victoria and South Australia. The remaining states and territories um, commenced much later, in 2006 to 2008. And it was at that time that, like the SCPE, we saw the exciting new adventure that we started with the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register. Establishing the ACPR would not have been possible without the considerable generosity and leadership from researchers from those early established registers. And in particular, I really want to take a moment to salute the work of Eve Blair, Linda Watson, Sue Reed, Dinah Reddy Howe, Peter Flett, Heather Scott, and the team at the Cerebral Palsy Alliance at that time, and continuing on now, um, Nadia Badawi, Iona Novak, and Sarah McIntyre. And aren't they a fantastic looking group of people, the ACPR group? I love that photo. So the ACPR itself is a population-based database which contains de-identified data from each state and territory CP register. Each CP register functions independently in terms of governance, ethics, and funding. But every three years, each group provides de-identified data to the ACPR. This combined data set is then used as a resource for researchers to study distribution, frequency, and severity of CP, causes and determinants, effectiveness of prevention strategies, and to help plan and evaluate services. The state and territory CP registers have their own independent program of research, but they also come together for the development of reports and sub-papers, and in this case we had a supplement um, a year or two ago, and um, data sharing and for recruitment across multiple states and territories. The establishment of the ACPR has provided the opportunity to create a much larger pool of data than we would have had otherwise, and this is particularly helpful when studying small groups within the larger CP cohort. For example, children with a specific motor subtype or a specific pre- and perinatal um, risk factor. The ACPR program has also facilitated collaboration with our colleagues internationally to answer questions that require these very large sample sizes. Examples of this includes a collab current collaboration with the SCPE um, and the ACPR where we're investigating congenital anomalies amongst children with CP. And that work's being headed up by Shona Goldsmith and um, Sarah McIntyre. And as you can see here, working together is not only useful, but it's a lot of fun. So in recent times, we've seen declining trends in the rates of pre- and perinatally acquired CP um, in Europe, from Japan, from Victoria, and listening to um, Marshall uh, presentation, we're hear hearing also the same pattern in the CDC. So we wanted to have a look at the um, Australian, uh, last Australian cer cerebral palsy register cohort. And using data from the three long-standing population CP registers, we saw an overall decline in rates um, from a range of 1.7 to 2.8 per 1,000 live births 
decreasing to a range of 1.4 to 2.1 in the last um, birth epoch. And as you can see, this decline in rates was not linear, and the minimum and maximum rates reported by CP registers differed considerably over time. We saw, we've seen declines in rates also across all gestational age groups, with quite marked reductions in the two most distal gestational age groups, those children born less than 28 weeks and those born at term. Pleasingly, we've also seen the proportion of children with moderate to severe disability decline during this time. And here we've used the same um, uh, classification system that SCPE uh, was referring to, Catherine was referring to, um, with um, moderate to severe disability being described as GMFCS 3 to 5 or IQ less than 50. We sincerely hope this trend in declining prevalence and severity um, seen in Europe and Australia will continue and we're very keen to get our next um, batch of um, data, which is next June. So we look forward to seeing whether this um, trend is going to continue. And this work's been completed by Claire Galea and hopefully you'll be able to read this in a publication um, in coming months. I'm now going to segue slightly to some other research activities that I've been working on over, um, with colleagues over the last few years. Oop, here we go. So since 2015, we've seen the emergence of new CP registers in the region, and these new programs have adopted the ACPR minimum data set, and they have access to the ACPR web-based database. The New Zealand CP Register, which is led by Sue Stott, Alexander Sorridge and Anna Mackey, um, started recently. And this is a very important partner group for the ACPR, and we're very excited to be working with this team. There are also new registers in low middle income settings, and in particular I wanted to highlight the Bangladesh CP Register, which has been headed up by Dr Gulam Kandaka, Professor Mohit and Tasman Karim who presented two wonderful papers earlier this morning. I don't know if any of you were at those papers, but they are fascinating. Also, Sri Lanka CP Register, led by Saman Mali Sumansina, Thelini Matashika, and Gopi Kitsunami. These registers in low-middle-income countries, I think, are very important. Um, because we don't really know, and in most of these settings, we have very little information about the number of children who are living with CP. We don't know the number of children who are dying with CP in these countries either. Focused attention on this population will provide new opportunities to highlight prevalence, clinical profile and severity, the availability of education and community rehabilitation, and most importantly, these registers and the dedicated researchers that are working on them, I believe, will unearth opportunities for prevention of morbidity and mortality. So speaking of prevention, I couldn't help but have a little chat about congenital cytomegalovirus. It's an area of passion for me. Um, so this is about some work we've been um, completing in recent times. So as many of you will know, congenital cytomegalovirus is, well, cytomegalovirus is a common herpes virus. And in healthy adults or healthy children, it's largely asymptomatic and causes very few problems. However, it is a neurotrophic virus, which means it can cross the placenta, infect the fetus, and cause damage to the developing nervous system. This can result in long-term sequelae, including sensory neural deafness, cerebral palsy, learning dis and de learning disabilities. In Australia, approximately one per thousand live births will have long-term sequelae um, as a result of CMV infection. Infants and young children are particularly good at transmitting this virus, <laughs> and I find it quite surprising, but they're able to excrete the virus in their urine and saliva for up to two years post-infection, so <laughs> keep those hands clean. There is, however, generally poor awareness of cytomegalovirus, which is surprising because it's an endemic virus um, in, uh, across the world, um, and there's poor awareness amongst both health professionals and pregnant women. In most parts of the developed world, unless a pregnant woman has a complication of pregnancy to suggest possible infection, or an infant has signs of possible CMV disease noted in the newborn period, they won't normally be tested. It won't be a routine part of testing. As such, the prevalence and long-term outcomes of CMV infection are not well defined. Detecting congenital CMV amongst children with CP, where we have to test beyond the neonatal period, when testing is obviously at its most sensitive, is a difficult business. 
It's hard to retrospectively go back after someone has been identified with CP and take urine and blood samples. So this has led to the need to use stored samples, um, in this case stored um, blood spots um, from newborn screening cards. So in a recent study, we recruited cases through the New South Wales and ACT CP registers and from community rehab services. And we got consent to um, access uh, these children's um, newborn screening cards, the children with CP. We tested their cards for CMV DNA using PCR and then we reported the results back to the families. So molecular testing um, of 323 cards resulted in 31 positive tests for CMV. And the proportion of children with CP who tested positive was markedly higher than that found amongst newborns in the community. Um, this finding suggests that neonatal CMV viremia may be highly prevalent amongst children with CP. Of course, there's so much more to do. It would have been lovely to have a case control study, which we didn't have in this, in, due to ethics issues. Um, but, so there's a lot more to do in this space. And the other thing we need to do is understand the um, relationship between CMV and other risk factors, um, such as genetic factors, congenital abnormalities, and maternal history among this group of children with CMV and CP. But for my mind, CMV remains an important risk factor for CP and for neurodevelopmental disability, not only because it may be more prevalent than we possibly have thought in the past, but because it's potentially preventable. Whilst there is yet no available vaccine, there are effective public health strategies which are available to reduce the maternal risk of CMV infection in pregnancy. These preventative strategies consist of simple hygiene precautions and have been shown to be acceptable to pregnant women and effective in reducing CMV zero conversion. Recently published consensus guideline um, recommendations show that all pregnant women and healthcare providers should be educated about congenital cytomegalovirus infection and these simple preventative measures. So I believe we need to build greater awareness of congenital CMV as a cause of neurodevelopmental disability and to promote these simple prevention strategies. So next year we're doing a social media campaign uh, it's a partnership between Cerebral Palsy Alliance and CMV Australia, and we're also, you guessed it, we're going to start another registry, um, looking at this time a CMV registry, which I understand you already have uh, a CMV registry in the state, so we're <laughs> playing catch up with you. So in summary, here I've described briefly the declining trends in prevalence of CP using data from three population state registers. We've talked about the declining um, trends and proportions of moderate to severe disability amongst children with CP from across Australia. We've talked about the new registers that are starting in the, in the region and highlighted CMV as a potentially preventable cause of hearing loss and neurodevelopmental disability. Lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to Sarah um, and the American Academy for this invitation. Thank you to the ACPR group for the fabulous and wonderful work that they do, and I'm very privileged to work with them. Um, and also just thank you very much to the families who so generously share their stories with the CP registers in our region. Thank you. Circling back to a Canadian accent. <laughs> Let's see if we can get my slides up. And the green button is this one here? The green, the green button. The green button. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So I think I'm the only one here with financial disclosures. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're all uh, connected to uh, uh, neuromuscular disease and spinal muscular atrophy and uh, not at all uh, impacting this uh, talk today. And uh, I'm here on behalf of the Canadian Cerebral Palsy Registry uh, with a, uh, a big team. Uh, many of the members are here in the room, uh, so now that we've been all sitting for an hour, I'm going to ask you all to get up one by one and, and kind of wave so everybody knows who you are, um, starting with uh, Sasha Dick, who is our national coordinator. There's Sasha. Hello, Sasha. Um, and then moving out from uh, west uh, to east, uh, we have Isaias uh, from BC, although I'm not sure, I haven't seen him. Uh, he is here, yay! <laughs> All right, uh, Northern Alberta and Edmonton, we have John Anderson. Hi, John, I know you're here. I'm blinded by the lights, so I can't <laughs> yes, see you guys, but, um, and we have um, uh, two leads out in uh, Calgary um, with uh, Adam Curtin having been there um, longer, and I've seen Adam in the room. Hi, Adam. 
uh, Darcy Fellings, of course, uh, who has the leadership for CPNet um, and uh, um, representing the Greater Toronto Area in our registry. Uh, province of Quebec overrepresented. Uh, we have myself and uh, Dr. Chevelle from Montreal. We have um, Louise Coclas uh, from um, uh, one of our uh, Montreal uh, rehabilitation centers, as well as uh, Dr. Nicole Pigeon uh, from um, uh, Sherbrooke, who is uh, out in the back of the room. Uh, and uh, uh, further east in uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, um, uh, we also have um, excellent representation, Dr. Woods and Buckley. So this is us. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to give you an overview of how you actually, you know, because I think my, my predecessors here talked about the registries, like it just happens, people just get together and all this beautiful data gets together, but it's actually a, a lot of work to um, just get it off the ground. Uh, and uh, it started uh, before I even joined it. Uh, there was a seed funding um, from uh, the chair of uh, CP in Laval um, and a uh, rehab um, kind of research group um, to start a Delphi consensus process, build a multidisciplinary kind of um, group uh, to uh, figure out kind of how to do this, uh, what variables to collect. Uh, we consulted with our European and Australian colleagues for this. Um, and uh, the initial registry actually was started um, as a pilot project in Montreal at a single site just to see how feasible it would be. And I think they tried to enroll about 50 kids, of which uh, 40 said yes. And uh, from, from the um, charts and interviews, they were able to collect almost 95% of the variables they were aiming to collect. So it was quite feasible and doable. And then they rolled it out uh, across uh, the province of Quebec to six administrative health regions. This way we know our denominators and who we're trying to capture. Uh, and this worked out well um, until about 2006 when the funding ran out and the registry was put on a, a state of suspended animation, um, if you will, uh, until 2009 when it picked up again in Montreal uh, and uh, in 2010 um, with the leadership of Dr. Chevelle and funding from NeuroDevNet, um, the Canadian Cerebral Palsy Registry was born. Uh, and here it was the six administrative health regions in Quebec, um, but then we also had um, the Greater Toronto Area joining with Darcy Fellings and also Northern Alberta um, with uh, John Anderson. And the following year, and this was great for the registry, uh, we uh, were able to secure more funding through the Public Health Agency of Canada in a partnership with the Neurological Health Charities of Canada Canada um, to include more sites, so going from bringing on British Columbia, Southern Alberta, um, and going out um, east. Um, and uh, we have functioned as is uh, until today, uh, and now we have 16 recruitment sites across the six provinces. Uh, we have now um, about 1,800 kids who are uh, part of the registry. And our uh, capture now, we have cohorts uh, from uh, the birth cohort of 1999 and on in the province of Quebec. Um, and then in the uh, NeuroDevNet um, uh, era uh, sites from 2008 on and the other sites from 2009 on. So it's a long story, but I think it kind of gives you an, an idea of how hard it is to kind of get this kind of registry going um, and, uh, and, and how to keep it funded um, continuously. And actually, if any of you are looking for uh, investment uh, to do, you come talk to me after because our, our funding is being renewed and we are looking for more funding to keep going. Uh, what do we capture? We actually capture a lot of data variables um, um, across different spheres, so from the clinical profile, so neuroimaging, subtypes, severity, some comorbidities. We also look at risk factors, prenatal, perinatal risk factors, as well as some sociodemographic uh, information. So it's kind of deep phenotyping, if you will, per um, child that we're trying to capture. Uh, and it's based on chart review and parental interview. So rather than focusing on a... Um, single study, I thought I'd give you an idea of what kind of um, data or output can come from the hard work of putting a registry together. Uh, so some examples of direct observations. So these are observations stemming s solely from the registry um, without um, trying to link it to any kind of outside uh, information. Uh, so we were able to um, show the prevalence of cerebral palsy for the first time using kind of population-based data, because uh, prior to this publication, we only knew it from um, two other publications out west in Canada that were using administrative health um, uh, data only. Um, some um, uh, looks at uh, comorbidities and relationships to subtypes 
and um, severity, um, relationships of gross motor and fine motor by manual ability, how much is preventable of uh, um, cerebral palsy following neonatal encephalopathy, uh, and um, a look at uh, kind of socioeconomic discrepancies um, in uh, CP, and this was in Quebec where we have a universal access to health care as well, and uh, this is, I think, the study that Marsha Lynn had um, referred to. Uh, one of the fun things about the registry, though, is that it actually uh, serves as a platform, um, much like any of the clinical registries can, can function, because families have consented to be contacted again um, to participate. And uh, so last year we had presented on the um, copy number variant um, study in our uh, group of children with CP. Um, there are um, abstracts now being presented, and, and um, uh, they haven't been published yet, but work on, on looking at uh, participation. Um, and this is led by um, Keiko Chicago Thomas, who's also in the room. Hopefully she can get up and wave. Um, and uh, this is uh, another study by Zach Boychuk, who's also here. He's a PhD candidate, a postdoc now, uh, with Annette Majnumer looking at uh, prompt referral. So this is early diagnosis, looking at current practices of um, uh, who's referring the children in and how long does it take them to actually get the diagnosis. Um, and then uh, outside of that, then doing some consensus work to come up with um, basically guidelines to improve on this because um, we know we can do better at identifying these children earlier. I've also linked the data within the registry to administrative health data um, to uh, try to see how accurate were these um, administrative health claims that were used previously to look at trends of CP prevalence. Is it really important for the registry to be doing this, or can we just use our administrative data? Um, and I think I showed this, um, if any of you were at the uh, meeting last year, uh, but um, so in gold, we have the having a diagnosis of CP within the registry. So we've, we've seen you. Uh, we know your medical records. We're uh, confirmed that you have CP. Um, and uh, on the left, you have the CP in the diagno um, uh, administrative health databases. So these are the physician claims databases. Uh, and um, you see that if you just simply calculate the prevalence of CP in Quebec, uh, both give you very similar uh, numbers and their confidence intervals overlap, but they're not the same kids. And in fact, the, um, out of the kids that we knew were in the registry and had CP, a third of them never had, up until 12 years of follow-up in administrative health claims, they never had a diagnosis of CP entered. So they were seen and coded for many other um, reasons. And so if you're using administrative health claims to look at um, health services use or needs, um, it's, uh, it's a warning sign not to do that um, and uh, uh, really use registry data to link into this. Uh, here's another example of um, a study that used the registry to enroll patients as well as other clinics. Um, and this is work by Linda Horwood, who's a PhD candidate. Uh, and uh, she was looking at the prevalence of uh, sleep disturbance um, in children with CP. And she found that one in five indeed had um, a sleep disturbance. And um, in her study, after adjusting for um, uh, the age group, because we knew that uh, children who were in um, um, early childhood, so just starting school, five, to eight years of age had the highest prevalence, um, and, and those who had the greatest severity had the highest prevalence of uh, sleep disturbance. Um, the best predictor of sleep disturbance in children with CP uh, was the presence of pain and having pain. Um, and this, uh, the findings are, I guess, not surprising, uh, but for me, it's, it really uh, sheds light to areas where we can really have an impact um, and make a difference leading to, you know, are we really answering the right questions? And so um, a lot of the registries, as Marshall Lynn had pointed out, are built um, depending on, on what you're trying to answer. And so I think it's important to remain fluid um, in the uh, structure of your registry and the variables that you're collecting over time, because obviously you can't collect everything all the time because it would be um, just incredibly difficult um, to sustain, um, but to um, keep asking yourself, am I asking, which questions am I asking? Am I collecting the right information for this? Um, and as in any clinic, um, 
you know, in, in parallel, uh, we um, are working on diagnosis and etiology as well as optimizing in, uh, outcomes, both in parallel, and I think both are really important. Um, but uh, for, for diagnosis, for example, in our registry currently, we're um, enrolling children um, with a diagnosis of CP at the age of two, and then reconfirming at the age of five and updating comorbidities and functional severity. Um, and um, across other uh, registers as well, we, you know, it's we really uh, come in after the age of two. Um, but then um, if there are efforts made, if prompt uh, does develop um, interventions um, and uh, does a, 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 you know, we'll maybe call you about the campaign that you're doing and, 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 and do a great campaign and, and get physicians to refer early and identify early in these high risk groups at high risk of developing CP. How do we see the needle change? Is our, are our registries currently built to see that? And I don't think they are. Um, so should we be changing our definition? What should we be capturing um, uh, initially? As well as optimizing outcomes. So obviously, um, you know, what are important outcomes or functions that we as researchers are um, thinking of, of addressing um, need to constantly be re, um, um, affirmed um, and informed um, by stakeholders, and there are numerous stakeholders, but patients and families really are the most important ones um, in my eyes. Um, there was a, a really lovely um, presentation earlier uh, today um, out of New York uh, looking at psychotropic uh, medication use um, in individuals with CP and um, some of the uh, motor um, consequences and, and side effects that are often under-recognized and what are best practices. Um, information that we're currently not capturing in our uh, registry. Um, so I will uh, end it there and open up to our question and answer. <laughs> Which probably isn't going to be very long because we don't have the so. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Peter Blasco, my mentor extraordinaire. No, Peter, you go. You go. I'm Peter Blasco from um, Oregon, Oregon Health Sciences University. <clears throat> and I have kind of the obvious question, so I'll direct it to the whole panel because I'm sure you guys have talked about this. It looks like the prevalence of CP in the Europe and uh, Australia is about... Um, two per thousand, and in the U.S. it's closer to three per thousand. Uh, any speculations as to why that is? Mm -hmm. Is it, how do it's we a, is it type of prevalence? Just is it on? Start talking though. Oh, yeah. okay. So um, this has always been a point of um, question in terms of the prevalence in the U.S. versus the prevalence that's reported from outside the U.S. So um, it's a question of which denominator you use. So in the U.S., we report a period prevalence. So we're looking at children that are eight years old who have CP, and our denominator is the children who are eight years old in the population. And so we're including children who were born in the area versus, and also those children who move into the area. If we, and we do have a publication where we actually use the birth prevalence, which is the, the denominator that's used, it's the measure that's used outside the U.S., we did that. Our prevalence is, is very similar. We, uh, we report the period prevalence because it gives you the total burden of CP in the population. It also is lined up with the prevalence of the other disabilities that we ascertain as part of the ADAM network. Um, Marshallin, you've been a tireless advocate to get population-based surveillance for CP in the United States. And yesterday, we heard from uh, Sue Swanson the issue of possibly creating regional centers of excellence equivalent to spinal cord injury, burns, and TBI. Mm -hmm. What could the Academy do to make sure that every atom site would surveillance would have surveillance for CP and not just <laughs> autism alone. What could make <laughs> CP as powerful on a policy level as the autism lobby? 
<laughs> Let me say that I just love all you guys, the Academy, <laughs> and all of you who have supported us have been absolutely wonderful over the years. And I continue to get that question about how there could be more support. Um, at, at CDC, as part of the federal government, we're not allowed to advocate, which means that I can't say that we need more money. So I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it really um, is a matter of advocacy. Um, we have a very strong lobby in the U.S., as you know, for autism. I've been in the field a long time. I've seen that happen. I know how it happens. I've talked to some of you about the steps and what's necessary to make it happen in the U.S. And, um, that's what it takes. It really takes um, collectively making the point that this is an important disability. Uh, it's as important as all the others and that we need to um, band together and support these efforts. And I think it's possible to do that. And uh, welcome, you know, um, the um, support of, of all of you. Thank you. We'll take a question from Maureen and then that's, we're probably gonna have to transition to our next presentation. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maureen O'Donnell from Vancouver. Um, thank you very much for all the presentations. Um, my question or comment is really for all of you. On Wednesday, a number of us were in a, a very comprehensive symposium about genetics and epigenetics. And one of the things that became unveiled at the end of the day was that there's starting to be confusion about diagnoses and how we name things. And really, it was related to underlying etiology. So if a child has genetic has cerebral palsy, phenotypically, and uh, then receives a genetic diagnosis of potentially a rare condition, sometimes the parents are like, well, I've been told he doesn't have CP now. And sometimes if they receive that diagnosis, they no longer are said to have CP for the purposes of counting because they now have another diagnosis that is related to their etiology. So one of the recommendations or thoughts that came out of our day on Wednesday was that perhaps as an academy, we need to get together with researchers like yourselves, perhaps our genetics friends, our neurology friends, and come together to think about using existing taxonomies, but to say that we need to think about etiology of the underlying condition the child might have, and of course advance the science around that, to think about phenotypically or phenomenologically what the diagnosis might be, like cerebral palsy or autism, and then to continue, of course, to think about the functional um, assessments and, um, and strengths and challenges of the child in keeping with the ICF. So sort of thinking about these three things. So um, I just am curious about, so we were kind of passionate about it by the end of the day on Wednesday. Um, and wanted to like charge forward asking for a task force. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts. Okay. So while, while you guys gather your thoughts, can I just have the next presenters come on up? Um, um, we, we talked a little bit about this in a, it's probably getting old now, but the what constitutes CP in the 21st century paper. And we talked about the yeah. fact that you can have these variety of um, genotypes, if you would, um, but if your phenotype is cerebral palsy and you fit under the umbrella that we're very happy to call you cerebral palsy, have cerebral palsy as your um, uh, description. Um, so I, I think it's a great idea, though, to, to review this again, and I think it's, it is a risk because as um, genetic testing becomes more and more sophisticated, we're going to see a random decline in prevalence of cerebral palsy that's mm -hmm. just to do with genetic testing. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that would be an unfortunate um, side effect. I also think it's difficult for parents. Um, sometimes there's a benefit for families to have this more phenotypical description in terms of accessing services, etc., mm -hmm. uh, versus having a very rare genetic descriptor where you don't have a group of people that are like you, like a, you know, a bunch of families who've got the same issues. But that's just my two cents worth. Can, can I add yeah. a, another? I think it's a great, great point. Um, and this um, confusion between diagnosis and etiology uh, prior to the kind of genetic revolution of CP um, already existed, you know, in our own um, hospital, um, uh, child, like I have a colleague who does um, uh, a brain malformation clinic, and a lot of those children have fixed motor deficits that, you know, 
would meet the um, diagnosis. Phenomenologic diagnosis. Phenomenal, exactly. Or um, I've met um, uh, families whose uh, children had had a, a stroke um, or uh, um, had a uh, traumatic brain injury under the age of two who were left with a motor deficit who, again, um, meet, you know, meet the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Um, so there is value in um, the phenomenology term of, of, of cerebral palsy or if, if we would even rename it as a cerebral palsy spectrum disorders um, because it is so wide and varied um, in, in some ways. Uh, but then not to confuse that with etiology. Um, and so, um, you know, with the genetics uh, coming in and identifying genes um, that would explain the motor pathways, uh, it just explains the etiology, but it still it has nothing to do, you know, the diagnosis is the diagnosis. It doesn't change that. That's good. I'd like to thank our panel so very, very much. Um, if you guys would remain after after the session, just to get photos. Not here, but later. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Corbett Ryan to present the ninth annual Corbett Ryan Pathways Pioneer Award, supported by Pathways.org. Good afternoon. Today I'm presenting the Corbett Ryan Pathways Pioneer Award. This award, presented together with Pathways.org, which provides free information to help all children reach their potential. Um, reach again, yeah, full potential. This year's award, this year the award is presented to a remarkable woman, Dr. Kathleen Frio. Dr. Frio has taken her life to research and helping others with cerebral palsy. She does this through research and education. Dr. Frio has postdoctorate, fellowship, PhD, and two, two master degrees. She is the director of the Early Brain Injury Recovery Clinic at the Burke Medical Research Institute and an associate professor at Cornell Medical College. Dr. Frio has been published over 40 times. Um, and is currently working on her third act on three active research projects. Please give me a warm welcome to Dr. Kathleen <laughs> Friel. Nice. Sorry, I didn't need to find my side. I'm sorry. There. 
Sorry. I think they're already my tights. <coughs> I start off by, um, saying how very grateful I am to you, Corbin, and to your family, to Shirley and Mr. Ryan. You have done so much to help people with disabilities over decades and decades. So I'd like us all to thank the Ryan family for all that they have done to help us all. So, Thank you. So, when I was a little bit under the age of two, I was diagnosed, and at that time, I wanted to be a cab driver. And, and uh, I mean, of course, I went to the lunch. That, that's very strange. But so, uh, According to this, to this um, rule, my life has been a failure. <laughs> but I'm very grateful for what I've been able to do, even though I haven't achieved those goals yet. <laughs> I'm extremely grateful to my own family, who has always provided Amends, encouragement, have love, and support. And they not only encouraged me to be independent, but they really demanded that I be independent. And if it weren't for, for them, I probably wouldn't be here. So thank you, Billy, and I wish they could be here. I also am very grateful to what I consider my science. That way, I did a PhD in training noodles out and then my postdoctoral training and early training with Jack Martin, Andy Gordon, and Holly Lizami. And these people took a chance on me. I was the first person who had cerebral palsy who any of them had worked with but less mentors. And I am very, very grateful for all that they have given me. I to thank my colleagues, many of whom are here in the audience. And I apologize if your picture is not up here. I really am so grateful for, for everyone who I think I'm in collaboration with over these many years. Research is so much fun, and I really love every day at work. I also want to give such a shout out to Dr. Lever from the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, who unbeknownst to me until like a month ago, nominated me for this award. So I wish he could be here also, but we thank him. Of course, I'm grateful, certainly for my own lab now, many of whom are here. And in my lab, we focus on improving the lives of people with cerebral palsy. And I'm very grateful to all of you, so thank you so much. So the goal, the overall goal of my research over these years has been to understand how our experience changes the nervous system. So we know from my work and much other work, many of which is done by you here, that experience drives changes in the brain. And I also believe that experience drives changes in society. So we are the ones who drive change. I mean, if anyone is a leader in inclusion, it, it, it needs to be us. We're the ones who know. We're the ones who have to take what we know out to everyone. In my PhD research, I showed that skill training 
changes the brain. So if you learn something, your brain changes. And in the other side research, I also showed, which I learned, that in an animal model zoology, training changes the brain. And now in our own lab, we're showing that in people with zoology, experience changes the brain. So we are the ones who have to make this change in the world. So there's a homework for all of us. So I want you all to listen to write this down, please. Um, <laughs> so really to engage your collaborators, your patients, or your patients and your subjects as to collaborators and research. And you get extra credits if you hire one. <laughs> which I've done, <laughs> which we've done in my other app, we've hired people who are full participants in our research. And really to start early, this needs to start in very, very young children, not just graduate students, but really from the youngest age to show all children, particularly children with disabilities, that they can do whatever they work hard to accomplish, and nothing should be beyond their reach. And take food scientists with disabilities as speakers, and also to make sure that the, the wheelchair room works. <laughs> that, that was five or delay today, so um, we always need to be aware of how accessible we are in everything that we do. So, I want to make it normal. I shouldn't get no word just for being who I am. Make it normal to see people with disabilities in professional roles and not just when people are, are talking about their own disability, but really to engage people to share their own talents because people with disabilities have, have so much to offer and to really focus on people's abilities and empowerment and not just the impairments that people might have. So again, I thank the Ryans and I thank all of you. So thank you so much. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Steve Couch uh, to come on up and present the Fred P. Sage Award. Hello. The Fred Sage Award is given each year to the best multimedia submission presenting clinical or research or educational material. And this year, the award is given to a Canadian, Stacy Miller. a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, I want to thank the Communications Committee for this award and I also want to sincerely thank and acknowledge my uh, colleagues on, on this project, uh, Dr. Kishore Malpuri and Dr. Maureen O'Donnell. And I lost the clicker that everybody's looking for when they're up here. I think that's there. <laughs> So we're happy to share with you today work we've done to create an educational resource for health professionals to support the implementation of HIP surveillance. We have no disclosures. It's well documented that HIP displacement is a common problem in children with cerebral palsy and that as displacement increases, children are at a greater likelihood for having pain, decreased mobility, and decreased quality of life. There's also strong evidence to support the use of hip surveillance, which includes both clinical exams and radiographs to identify hip displacement early and prevent dislocations. 
And yet if you look at how surveillance is done across the world, whether it be in Sweden, Australia, the UK, Canada, the US, it's different based on how we implement. And yet universal to all of them is the need for knowledge translation. And certainly that's the case in our province. We have about a million square kilometers to cover when we were looking at implementing hip surveillance. We're fortunate to have physio physiotherapists in child development centers, of which there are 39, and in about 55 of 60 of our school's districts. And we were fortunate to collaborate with them. They identified themselves as being the most appropriate professionals to identify children for, for enrollment in our program and to complete the clinical exam. But this meant that we needed a way to reach all of them and educate them. And so that led to the creation of this e-learning module. So it's freely accessible online, so any of you can access it for use. If you go to our program's website, it's childhealthbc.ca backslash hips. And if you go to the bottom of that page, there's a section for provider resources uh, where you can access the learning module as well as other resources that we have for the program. So I'm going to attempt to use the internet in hopes that it's going to work. I've lost my mouse. The yes, mouse is right behind the screen. Thank you. So this is what the module looks like. Um, it takes about 45 minutes to complete. Um, you're not hearing the volume now, but there is a voiceover for the entire uh, module. Um, but if you wish, you are able to read a transcript of, of the en entire, co excuse me, entire content. Um, you can start and stop and resume wherever uh, you choose. You'll notice along the top, there's essentially seven sections to the module, including both an introduction and a conclusion. And those include a pre and post test so that users can evaluate uh, their learning. The first main component of the module is related to understanding hip displacement. So that includes information about the incidence of hip displacement, um, the treatments for it, and then of course the use of hip surveillance and the evidence behind it. Uh, the second major section is on our BC consensus, so this is related to the guidelines that we use for our program. And again, it goes through the clinical exam, so there's videos that um, show the different measurements that we use, information about the radiological components, and then of course the frequency at which we order radiographs and clinical exams. Some of you may be aware that the Academy has recently completed the care pathway for hip surveillance. And so it's our intention to update our BC guidelines to reflect that uh, consensus uh, process that's been undertaken. So if you're looking for guidelines to undertake, um, this will be updated to reflect those guidelines. So it will be apl applicable to you. Uh, the next section is on GMFCS level. So hip surveillance is very much based on needing to know a child's GMFCS level. So we wanted therapists to be well versed in this tool. And again, I'm going to hope that this works. Can't guarantee it. But there's examples within uh, videos so ch people can practice identifying which uh, GMFCS level children are at. Uh, the last section is related to a group four hemiplegic gait pattern. So we did a knowledge and needs survey of therapists prior to implementing, and certainly the big knowledge gap was related to being able to identify this type of gait pattern. And of course, this video is not going to work. Oh, there it goes. So we've got videos of each of the different gait patterns in hopes that being able to visualize, it's not running, but it's because of the slow internet, but you get the idea. Um, and then lastly, there's a resources and um, contact page. And so this, again, you can access other resources related to our program and um, our contact information. And I certainly welcome any feedback that you have about um, the module. As I said, we'll be updating it in the next few months to reflect the changes from the Academy's care pathway. And I will just conclude by saying this is really designed for professionals, but it's my hope and my goal to, to next do something for children and families. Thank you.
Um, <clears throat> so next we would like to have Talia Collier right there <laughs> come on up and she is going to introduce our Duncan Wyeth Award winner. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here to present the Duncan Wyeth Award on behalf of the Adoptive Sports Committee. And this year's award goes to Luca Patuelli, otherwise known as Lazy Legs. Um, we select a Duncan Wyeth Award recipient based on someone who is dedicated to any type of sport. They're a great athlete, but at the same time, they're a huge advocate for adoptive sports. So when our committee came together, we thought that he would be a perfect selection. Um, I'll just read a quick history or bio for his story so you guys can all become familiar with him. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today because he um, was invited to be the best man in his friend's wedding. We were going to call his friend and say, hey, can you change your wedding date so he can be here? But we decided to go ahead and let him go. But anyways, um, talking about Luca, his story is that he was born with arthrogryposis, and as a child, he ended up undergoing at least 16 different surgeries growing up to help with his hips, his spine, his shoulders, and his legs. That didn't slow him down because even as a youth, he participated in sports such as soccer, football, baseball, rock climbing, surfing, and skiing. He ended up being on his high school swim team, his high school diving team, and even outside of that, he loved skateboarding. Unfortunately, around the age of 15, while he was skateboarding, he ended up having another surgery for his knee, and at that time, that was around the time he got introduced to dance because he had to kind of slow up things um, with skateboarding. Once someone introduced him to hip hop dance, he fell in love with it, and he has pursued this dance career and has made a great name for himself, both locally and nationally, and even on the international stage. He was so competitive, even during one of his routines, he ended up with a fracture during a dance-off, but he still didn't let that slow him down. Once he recovered, he kept on going. Um, with his wife, who is, I've heard, is also an occupational therapist, They've actually um, formed a group called Project RAD, which they actually train uh, teachers to teach dance to kids with disabilities. And then his dance group was also called Ill Abilities, and he used that name because he, in the hip hop world, ill means actually very good or sick. So he actually adapted that name because his, him and his dance group were like awesome dancers. And actually the five members in his original dance group also had disabilities. Um, because he gained so much notoriety, he has been invited to different shows on television. He's been on Ellen DeGeneres, he's been on So You Think You Can Dance for the Canada version and actually made it up pretty high for his rounds, the Today Show, and even more. He also is a motivational speaker and during all of this he even completed college with his degree in marketing while juggling his dance career. So he is a true example for what we thought fit well with our theme this year of dare greatly and to enter the arena because despite all of his obstacles, he was still able to accomplish what he wanted to for himself, but also remembered those behind him and did a great program and is still doing great things for other people, kids and adults for dance with disabilities. Okay, and I think there's a video acceptance speech for him. Hi, my name is Luca Batuelli. I am also known as B-Boy Lazy Legs. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person to accept this award. I am currently in Italy, standing next to my best friend for his wedding as his best man. And I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for recognizing me for this award. Um, it's a huge honor uh, to be able to share my passion with people from all over around the world, people of all abilities, um, and for you to be able to recognize me and, and give me an award for this, I uh, am deeply, deeply, deeply honored. So thank you, thank you very much. I'm sorry again that I can't be there in person to accept this award. I know that maybe we'll have the opportunity to dance together um, in the near future. 
Uh, for those that don't know who I am, I am a professional dancer and motivational entertainer. I truly believe that everyone can dance. If your heart is beating, you're creating a rhythm within your body. And it's the slightest movement that makes the greatest difference in a performance. So right now in your seats, whether you know it or not, you are all dancing. Um, just to give you guys a little bit more of a visual, I'd like to share with you a video of how I move and how I teach others to move their own way. I hope you guys enjoy, and I hope that I'll have the opportunity to meet you all in person one day. Thank you again. Have a great rest of the conference, and peace. If your heart is beating, you're creating a movement within your body. My name is Luca Patuelli, aka B-Boy Lazy Legs, and I'm a professional dancer. Growing up, my parents were a huge influence in my life, and they never treated me any different. My father always taught me your first failure is not to try. I'm trying to develop my style when I'm practicing. I'm trying to give myself challenges of how can I drop down to the floor, dancing with the crutches, but then finding a creative way of letting them go without just dropping them. A moment that I was extremely proud of was when I got to do the opening ceremonies of the Paralympic Games in Vancouver. That was a, a proud Canadian moment. When I moved to Montreal, it's there where I discovered what hip hop really is all about. I've built this community and it's really become more of a family. I could be extremely tired this morning, actually I was super sick, but the minute I walk into the class there's just this rush of adrenaline and then I kind of forget about it. If I have an idea for a move or for something that I want to learn, I'll kind of just bring that into the classroom. And often what's really cool is that my students are teaching me just as much as I'm teaching them. I'll always be involved in dance, whether it's teaching, choreographing, producing events. I don't think it'll ever escape me. <laughs> but I, I want to rule the world. <laughs> A message from the Government of Canada. I'd like to invite up to the stage Dr. Uh, Eugene Monasterio to announce the Gail Arnold Free Paper Award. Find my information here. Sarah, do you have the information? Sorry. Great page. I'll get you the place. Thanks again. It's my privilege again to represent the Children's Hospital Foundation in Richmond um, in presenting the Gail Arnold Award um, for the best uh, free paper um, this year. The Gail Arnold Award goes to Alicia Spittle in her paper titled The Randomized Control Trial of an Early Preventive Care Program for Infants Born Very Preterm, the Role of Social Risks on Cognitive Outcomes Throughout Early Childhood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the Academy for receiving this award and another hard act to follow. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, my co-authors, who you can see listed here, but not only my co-authors, but our fantastic research team, the Victorian Infant Brain Study, who are located in Melbourne, but we've got collaborators all over the world, our funders, and also the families that have been involved in these studies over a number of years. I have no disclosures to declare. As many of you here will know, children who are born preterm are at an increased risk of a number of different challenges, including cognitive, language and motor impairments. These are exacerbated for children who are born preterm from socially disadvantaged environments. 
We also know that both mothers and fathers of children who are born very preterm have higher rates of mental health problems, including anxiety, depression and stress, which can have negative impacts on family systems. We know that children who are born preterm are a heterogeneous group, but we do know that medical, social and environmental risk factors influence development. Medical risk factors such as brain injury are well known to affect development, but also social and environmental factors, particularly once the child has gone home from hospital, have a big impact on development. Our research team led by Gihan Roberts has shown that very preterm children, those with both medical and social risk factors, are actually underserviced by early intervention services in Victoria, Australia. Whilst the evidence is varied, uh, early developmental interventions are recommended to improve cognitive motor and behavioural outcomes of preterm infants and improve well-being well -being of parents. However, it's unclear whether benefits of early intervention may vary according to social risk of the family. We have previously uh, published a randomised controlled trial and if you'd like to find out more about the intervention program you can read this protocol paper. But we did a preventative care program for preterm infants born at less than 30 weeks gestation and it involved nine home visits with a physiotherapist and a psychologist working together and we saw the infants from post discharge up until 12 months corrected age. We showed that this intervention program improved child behaviour at two years and parents, or the primary caregivers I should say, had less anxiety and depression symptoms. <coughs> at four years we were able to show that the children still had improved behavioural outcomes and the parents reported less anxiety. And at eight years, seven, seven years after the original intervention had finished, we found no differences in child outcomes but parents still had less signs of depression. So the aim of this particular study was to explore the differential effects of, early, of the early intervention program for the preterm children on neurodevelopmental and parent mental health outcomes at two, four and eight years according to social risk of the family. We recruited 120 infants in the larger trial and at term or shortly after birth we got families to complete a social risk index and this takes into account family structure, the education of the primary caregiver, the occupation of the primary caregiver, employment status of the primary income earner, language spoken at home and maternal age at birth. So the control group uh, received standard care which in Victoria at that time and currently is still the case was very variable but children could be referred for early intervention if it was felt um, necessary. And then the intervention group had a standard uh, intervention package which as, as I said earlier consisted of physiotherapy and psychology who saw the um, children from post discharge up until 11 months of age. At two years we assessed cognitive language and motor development using the Bailey 3 and at four and eight years we assessed cognitive and language development using the differential ability scale and motor development using the movement ABC. Uh, at all time points we were able to assess for signs of anxiety and depression using the same outcome measure, the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, also known as the HADS. And then we looked at ch child and parent outcomes at each of those time points and comp compared group differences for children with higher and lower social risk using linear regression. We modelled our statistics using just generalising estimating equations to allow for multiple births and we had an interaction term for group and social risk. And I should point out that this was an exploratory analysis. We weren't originally powered to look at these subgroups. So as I mentioned, we recruited 120 infants. At two years, we had 97% uh, follow-up break thanks to our fantastic research nurses. At four years, 89% follow-up of our survivors. And at eight years, 85% follow-up. You can see, just looking at the perinatal characteristics, that there was a similar gestational age, birth weight, uh, proportion of males, and brain injury between the higher social groups and lower social groups between intervention and control. So then if we look at the interaction effects, what we saw was that for cognitive outcomes at two and four years, language outcomes at eight years, and motor outcomes at four years, that there was a differential effect according to social risk in response to intervention. So what does this actually mean? Well, if we look at cognitive outcomes at two years on the Baileys, what we can see for the lower social risk group is that for the control group, they had a mean of around 98, the intervention group around 97, and we so see no differences here between the two groups. But if we look at the, sorry, the higher social risk group, what we see is the control mean is 92, 
the intervention mean is much higher and we see almost a 10 point difference here between the higher social risk intervention and control groups. We see a similar pattern at four years, although not statistically significant for the higher social risk group. And again, a similar pattern at eight years, but we can see that we're getting smaller, um, lower rates of follow up and that we're not seeing statistically significant differences here, but there still is that trend. For motor outcomes, again, we see this, a similar pattern that there's a, a differential effect between the social risk groups. And the same thing for language scores at eight years, that the higher social risk group in response to intervention are having much higher scores. Now, if we look at parent mental health, it's a slightly different story and we didn't find any interaction effect. At two years, we found that those um, families in the intervention group both had less signs of anxiety, which is good. And then at four years, we found only those of the lower social risk group had uh, lower anxiety. And then when we look at depression, again, we see no interaction effect, but we do see that there's actually a significant um, effect of intervention on the lower social risk group. So to summarise, we found better cognitive outcomes at two and four years in children from the higher social risk in response to the intervention, but not the lower social risk group. And there was also a differential effect on motor outcomes at four years and language outcomes at eight years. And there was less depression at four years in the primary caregivers in the lower social risk group who received intervention. So we do um, have concluded that this study supports that we do need um, to look at social risk and consider the family's needs and early intervention was associated with greater improvements in, the early, cognitive, in early cognition compared with standard care for families in the higher social risk group, although these effects were not sustained at school age. And intervention had a greater effect on primary care given mental health in the lower social risk group compared to the higher social risk group. And we really need to be thinking about families when targeting intervention. So I just wanted to finish off um, by saying a big thank you to my family. I've the, I'm the little one with the red hair, my sister's in the middle and my brother's on the other side. And I've grown up in a family of disability and I've known disability my whole life. And I often think about what my brother's life might be like if he receives some of the interventions and other services that we have today. But I've also seen the effect of my brother's disability on my mother's mental health in particular. And it hasn't always been for the best. So I really encourage you all to think about not just looking at the child, but looking at the whole family and really making sure we support the whole family. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, wonderful work. Next, we'll be presenting the 11th Annual Mentorship Award to present the award. I welcome Susan Sienko. It is great, with great honor that I get to present the Mentorship Award to Dr. Michael Sussman. We've had the pr privilege of working with Dr. Sussman for the past 26 years. Dr. Sussman has always advocated for what is best for the patients, and as Chief of Staff, he instituted a parent care model that it utilized a team approach to the management of children with musculoskeletal disorders. Dr. Sussman, for us, was instrumental in establishing the clinical research department over 25 years ago, and he continues to support, promote, mentor the younger faculty, residents, and clinical research staff in developing the research interests. Dr. Sussman has expanded our international fellowship program and has contributed to the education and research careers of many future leaders in pediatric orthopedics. Dr. Sussman ensures that our international fellows learn about the intricacy and efficacy of various pediatric orthopedic procedures and the importance of a team and family-centered approach to care. In addition, he also takes the time to personally expose them to things about American life and culture. Dr. Sussman works with, worked with Dr. Garen Kloyan to establish the Eastern European and Mediterranean Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Society and has continued to support them by participating in their meetings in China, 
Lebanon, Greece, Poland, and Russia. And Israel. <laughs> and, and Dr. Kalayan says that Dr. Sussman feels that by training people from around the globe to provide care for children with disabilities in their respective countries, that he is providing care to each and every child with a disability. Dr. Sussman's knowledge regarding the care of children with childhood onset disabilities, his ability to critically examine the care provided through research, and his strong leadership and mentorship skills have served to develop the future leaders in the area of clinical research and clinical care, thus enhancing the lives of children with childhood onset disabilities. It is my pleasure to present the Mentorship Award to Dr. Sussman. Thank you. This is a fantastic honor. I just have a few actually quick comments, but uh, this is uh, probably the high point of my career. This is really a wonderful uh, award. But when I heard about it, why me? Uh, what's special about me? I mean, I've met all my friends here at the Academy who uh, are equal or at least uh, uh, better at mentorship uh, than I am. And, uh, you know, you hear all the people talking about the people who have mentored them. Uh, Catherine Friel talked about her mentors and then about the people who she's now mentoring. So I decided to figure out what it meant to be a mentor. Uh, meant to be a mentor. Hmm. So <clears throat> I, of course, went to the internet and uh, found some definitions and found that there are more than 50 definitions for the word mentor. Uh, a great teacher may be a great mentor, but being a great mentor involves a lot more than just teaching. Sports team coaches are mentors. So if you're a coach, what's the most important thing? To teach the technique or plays to your, to your, your team or the motivation you provide that stimulates your players to excel for themselves and for you. Which one is a mentor? Which one would you like to have for your coach? That's easy. So is mentoring active or passive? Uh, does it involve sitting with someone and counseling them? Do you have to work with them personally? I've had several mentors who I've known from this academy I've never worked with but have had huge influence on me. Does a mentor even have to be a real person? I mean, why did you all go into medicine? Uh, have you ever been stimulated by a fictional character? Uh, people in my generation <laughs> might have uh, looked up to Dr. Kildare. Subsequent generations. <laughs> and even more recent, have had other maybe role models, but uh, anyway, people that have made them interested in going into medicine. Who wouldn't want to be like George Clooney? Come on. Uh, so this, I went, uh, this was a, a television show back in the 50s. They actually did have television and electricity then. Uh, that I remembered, and I remembered that there was a character on this show whose name was Mentor. So I went to look it up, and I didn't find that character, but I found this somewhat unsubstantiated quote, that the show became an icon in the aviation community. Many pilots, including American astronauts, grew up watching Sky King and named him as an influence, and he was a rancher that flew around the West catching criminals. And doing good. So as a health professional, is it the facts you teach or is it the way you treat and interact with patients, families, and fellow health professionals that makes you a good mentor? If you can get over the Pepto-Bismol pink, uh, the thought here is actually uh, quite nice, that the greatest mentors inspire. So my definition of an ideal mentor, someone who inspires you to excel, someone who you want to admire you as much as you admire them. Someone for whom you strive to do your best and you never want to disappoint. So think of the people who inspired you, 
figure out what they did to achieve this, and try and incorporate these qualities in your life, and you'll be a great mentor, as many of you in the audience are. So I wish I could just chop up this award and share it with all of you, but at least in spirit, I share all of you, uh, uh, with all of you, this award. And uh, the journey of being mentored by someone and then mentoring others. It's a wonderful part of our practice. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite up to the um, stage Lynn Fogel of Pe Pedal with Pete, and then Iona Novak of Cerebral Palsy Alliance. I, I, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, it's going to be you, James Blackman of Cerebral Palsy Alliance. Sorry. Um, a key mission of the Academy is to promote excellence in research for the benefit of persons with cerebral palsy and childhood onset disabilities. One way in which the Academy promotes research is through research grants. Um, we fortunate to have the partnership with other organizations that feel similar. Um, the Academy of Cerebral Palsy um, was able to, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> sorry, my voice is getting less and less, <laughs> um, <clears throat> awarded a grant this year to Laura Miller. Is she here? Laura Miller. Um, her grant is entitled, Wow, Welcome Orientation workshops, new ideas for parenting a child with an early onset neurodisability in the 21st century. Pedal with Pete also makes grant available for uh, grant funding available for us. The Pedal with Pete Foundation is a philanthropic organization <clears throat> dedicated to raising funds for research to improve the quality of life for persons with cerebral palsy. This foundation was established to raise money for research to help prevent and treat effects of cerebral palsy. Pedal with Pete continues to focus on expanding our annual ride, or the annual ride, to other cities, leading to increased funding for CP research. And this Pedal with Pete grant um, this year went to um, Dr. Gorder, and I know he's here. Come on up. <clears throat> he's got a grant entitled Biomarkers for Cerebral Palsy, and I know that. Lynn is happy to congratulate you on that today. <clears throat> and then finally, the CP Alliance um, is a research foundation of Cerebral Palsy Alliance, which offers a range of grants to support research to, into the prevention and cure of cerebral palsy. Uh, the successful application will have a commitment to and a track record in cerebral palsy research um, with a focus on prevention or cure. Any of the members of the AACP DM, DM are eligible to apply, and the, the details are on the website. This year, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance grant goes to uh, Dr. Andrea Gusetta. And is he here? Yes, awesome. For his work entitled Computerized Assessment of Spontaneous Motor Activity in Infants Toward an Objective of Biomarker of Cerebral Palsy. So I'd like to thank all those folks and all of you who applied. Uh, for um, both the funding as well as rece receipt of grant support. Oh, okay. Ooh, Peter is dis <laughs> disguised as Laura Miller. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> um, so if you would all stay here. Um, to get your photos taken. <laughs> your photo is Laura Miller, that's funny. Um, the rest of you, um, we thank you and it's time to take a break and get ready for your instructional courses. Don't forget though to vote for your demonstration poster and the uh, life shots that those votes are closed at four o'clock.